Falconera, Falk the Black, the Count of Anjou, was a bad dude. A plunderer, oathbreaker, and murderer. To ensure his position in the politically fractured post-Carolingian Europe of the late 10th and early 11th century, Falk resorted to near constant warfare directed against his neighbors. Still, violence against other combatants in the heat of battle was one thing. But Folk the Black was even capable of extreme violence against his own family members. In the year 999, Folk was having marital problems. His wife of 15 years, Elizabeth of Vendôme, had still not produced a male heir for him. Perhaps suspecting that it was her husband's contribution, so to speak, that was lacking and desiring to provide the son that society demanded of her, Elizabeth had taken a lover. Unfortunately, her husband discovered this affair and knowing what kind of man he was, Elizabeth was aware that drastic action was needed if she was going to survive. So she took control of one of his citadels, the citadel at Angers. An irate folk besieged the citadel, and during the conflict, Elizabeth fell from the ramparts, only barely surviving the plummet. When he finally got his hands on her, Falk then had his injured wife burned alive for adultery, and in a similar fashion, he also set fiery flames to the citadel. The inferno spread and consumed much of the surrounding city. Thus ended Falk the Black's first marriage, in the smoldering ashes of Angers, with his wife's charred corpse at the center of it. It was a typical response from Falk, who showed mercy to no one and allowed his temper and love of violence to direct the course of his life. However, Falk was also deeply religious. He truly believed in God, and he knew in his heart of hearts that his crimes had the ability to condemn him to eternal suffering in putrid hell. Tormented by visions of his future damnation, Falk resolved to seek an indulgence, forgiveness that would lessen the punishment due for his sins. He schemed and arranged an alliance with his former enemy, King Robert II of France, cementing their new partnership with a marriage between the king and Falk's first cousin, Constance of Arles. And he placed his half-brother, Maurice, in command of the Angevin state. With his county secure, in September of 1003, Falk the Black focused on ensuring the well-being of his immortal soul. He undertook a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He crossed the Alps and traveled by land through Italy. At Bari, he took a ship that delivered him to the Holy Land, at that time a province of the wealthy Fatimid Caliphate. When he returned over a year later in 1005, he felt as though a weight had been lifted off his chest. Falk wrote to the Archbishop of Tours that the experience had quieted the fear of Gehenna he'd felt in his heart, well aware of the vast quantities of Christian blood that had been spilled by his own hand. Doubling down on his attempts to avoid damnation, he committed to the construction of a monastery on the best site of his lands, so that the monks there might pray day and night for the redemption of his soul. His abbey stands to this day known as Belli Locus in Latin, and in French as Beaulieu, meaning beautiful place, and it has given its name to the surrounding commune, beaulieu le loche Soon after his return, in December of 1005, the Count remarried. His new bride was Hildegard of Sundgau. Just a year later, Hildegard gave birth to a boy, Geoffrey. In a haze of bliss, Falk claimed that the ferocity within him had been replaced with sweetness. Unfortunately for those around him, this sweetness soon turned bitter. In the spider's web that was French politics of the 11th century, Falk was soon forced to go back to his scheming. In 1007, he traveled to Rome. There, he made an alliance with Pope John IX, who was seeking more direct influence in France. Falk convinced the Pope to place his monastery, Bellilocus, directly under papal authority, undercutting the rights of Archbishop Hugh of Tours. In 1008, though, the Archbishop allied with another of Falk's enemies, Abbot Robert of saint Florent, and supported a forged document that the abbot claimed showed many of the lands held by Falk and some of his supporters were rightfully part of saint Florent. Things got even worse when King Robert repudiated his second wife, Queen Constance, Falk's cousin and ally, so that he could take up once more with his former wife, Bertha. Constance had given birth to sons, which was apparently all Robert had wanted, and the king could now once again indulge his affection for Bertha. How romantic. 
Falk considered all of these events to be the machinations of a longtime rival, the Count of the Palace, Hugh of Beauvais. So Falk the Black planned an assassination. He ordered 12 of his men to kill the meddling interloper. Good news, they succeeded in ambushing and murdering Hugh. Bad news, they killed him during a royal hunting party, and the king had personally witnessed the deed. Worse news, they had been identified as Falk's goons. A group of judges found the killers guilty of a capital crime. And what's more, they also found Falk guilty of having harbored the murderers. Falk was pronounced guilty of treason and now risked being excommunicated. Falk swore to the king that he would prove his innocence by oath, or if need be, in trial by combat. The king accepted Falk's offer, but added two more requirements. Falk would have to repudiate the murderers and bring them to trial. Falk was bound to these men though. He was their lord, and if he did as the king asked, his credibility would be left in tatters. He depended on men like these to fill the ranks of his military force. Without them, he was powerless. If he turned his back on the killers, his other men might abandon him as well. But if he refused to submit to the king, he would be excommunicated, formally charged with treason, and with the king's backing, his enemies would eat him alive. But Falk the Black was nothing if not clever. In 1009, when it seemed either choice of the two available to him would result in doom for the Count of Anjou, he went for option three. He went on pilgrimage again. He would once again leave his half-brother Maurice in charge, then travel south to Rome, where he would once again seek the favor of the Pope, and then on to Jerusalem. At first glance, his decision might seem illogical, but Falk knew that during his absence and upon his return, he would be untouchable. As for the men who had murdered Hugh of Beauvais, far from repudiating them, Falk supposedly rewarded them with riches. And when he arrived in Rome and met the new Pope, Sergius IV, he asked that the Pope absolve him and his men of the crime of premeditated murder. Falk likely knew that King Robert had asked the Pope for a divorce so that he could legally separate from Constance and be with his true love, Bertha. The Pope had refused and upheld the marriage of King Robert and Queen Constance. Remember that Falk had blamed Hugh of Beauvais as responsible for attempting to break up this royal marriage, which had the blessing of the Pope. So Falk's murder of this man had been an attempt to remove this treacherous snake sowing division in the royal house. If anything, the Pope should thank him. And it seems the Pope did indeed grant absolution to Falk. So the Count was able to continue his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, knowing that he had the Bishop of Rome on side. Falk's pilgrimage coincided with a violent turn of events in the East, as news came that the ruler by the order of God, Al-Hakim bi Amrala, the Mad Caliph of Cairo, had begun to persecute Christians and had even ordered the destruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. As far as those in France knew, Falk might very well have been martyred. So despite the Count's absence, his enemies hesitated to act against the Angevin state. As to attack the lands of a martyred pilgrim who had been absolved by the Pope, well, that would have been unthinkable. Remarkably, Falk returned from the East in 1101. By then, news of the Caliph's insanity had traveled far and wide, and the Christians of Europe must have thought Falk to be favored by God to have survived this pilgrimage. He returned laden with holy relics and even a piece of stone he claimed to have secretly broken off the Lord's very tomb. This time, there was no blissful honeymoon period. If anything, Falk's ferocity seems to have been stoked. He spent the next few years terrorizing his former enemies and making money. The monastery of Belli Locus had developed into a bustling town and Falk granted considerable tax breaks to those who came to populate it. He also began to mint coins with the image of the Holy Sepulchre on them to symbolize the events of his second pilgrimage. He then took the profits from his growing wealth and invested it in fearsome castles, the kind of which still dot the French landscape today. Western Europe was experiencing a boom and the Count of Anjou benefited from it greatly. Indeed, Falk the Black lived a long life full of scheming and war making. By the year 1035, he'd accomplished much. The county of Anjou was one of the most powerful states in Western Europe, possibly the strongest in all of France. His son, Geoffrey Martel, had grown into his own. Falk the Black had experienced a traumatic childhood. His mother had died when the boy was only four years old, his younger brother soon after. 
he had grown up isolated and separated from his father's second wife and his half-brother, Maurice, who he only became close to after their father's death. And their father's death had come when Folk was only in his teens. By comparison, Folk, despite the violent end to his first marriage, seems to have had a functional partnership with his second wife, Jeffrey's mother, Hildegard, and he had taken care to include his son in the family business from a young age, preparing Jeffrey well for the task at hand, perhaps with memories of the hard lessons he'd had to learn as a young count on his own. But Falk had lived a violent life, and as his bones grew brittle and his youthful vigor faded, he began once again to think of the rotting hell that awaited him in the beyond. In 1035, he resolved to undertake a third pilgrimage. He once again traveled to Rome, then to Constantinople. The Roman Empire was under the rule of Zoe the Macedonian Empress and Mikhail V, the lover she'd raised to the role of emperor after murdering her first husband, Romanos III. It was in the Roman Empire that Falk the Black met with the Duke of Normandy, Robert. Robert was actually Falk's great nephew. Falk's elder sister was Robert's grandmother. The Duke of Normandy was returning from his own pilgrimage to Jerusalem. However, shortly after their meeting, Robert mysteriously died. Who knows what happened in those faraway eastern lands? But rumor has it, Robert died of poisoning. And some even dare to whisper that it was his great uncle who had orchestrated the Duke's death. Robert lacked legitimate heirs. He'd left Normandy in the hands of his bastard son, William, who was only eight years old. As two of the most powerful states in France, Anjou and Normandy had long enjoyed a bloody rivalry. The death of the Duke would open the door to Angevin dominion. After all, young William the Bastard would never amount to anything. And Robert, Duke of Normandy, was no saint himself. Why do you think he'd gone on pilgrimage in the first place? Everyone knew Duke Robert had poisoned his own brother. Murdering a murderer with the same weapon he'd used? That was certainly justified. And regardless, Falk the Black was soon in the Holy Land ready to pay penance for any sins he may have committed. Perhaps surprising some, the by now 66-year-old Count returned once more from the Holy Land, and he was once again in the thick of it. The following years would see him enter into conflict with his own son, Geoffrey. The father is said to have made the defeated son kneel before him, to be kicked, while his old man howled at him, You are conquered! You are conquered! But just a few years later, Falk is said to have begun to see his death around the corner. He repaired his damaged relationship with Geoffrey and settled the rest of his earthly affairs before preparing to pay penance one last time. Falk Nera, Falk the Black, Count of Anjou, was a bad dude. Pride and wrath ruled him, but he was a product of his environment, the knightly aristocratic class of Latin Christendom, a world that prized brute force above all other virtues. Despite the fact that their holy book warned of their eternal damnation, in a violent age, people were spiritually torn between aspiring to both meet the demands of their messiah and doing what needed to be done to survive. Falk, like so many others, reconciled these two competing obligations by means of pilgrimage. And with one foot in the grave, Falk is said to have undertaken the most extreme of his pilgrimages. In 1040, the 70-year-old count once again found himself at that city beloved of God, Jerusalem. Under the Levantine sun, Falk the Black stripped naked. One of his servants wrapped a rope around his neck and dragged his body along the ground, up to the sepulcher of Christ, while another servant beat him on the bare back with a stick. With tears in his eyes, naked, covered in dirt and bruises, the decrepit bag of bones cried out to the heavens, Lord, receive wretched folk, your oath breaker, your fugitive. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, look after my repentant soul. If you'd like to learn more about how Falk the Black and others like him represented Latin Christendom's growing obsession with pilgrimage, 
and how just 39 years after Folk's final pilgrimage in 1099, Jerusalem would witness the arrival of an armed pilgrimage that not only absolved its participants of their sins, but made use of their bellicose nature to conquer the holy city. Well then, join us at History of the Utremer, a podcast detailing the rise and eventual fall of the states founded in the wake of the First Crusade. Available to stream on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast fix from. Links in the description below.